Thank you very much. Uh, on the, in the interest to be sure that I stay within my allotted time, under some warnings of punishments not disclosed, <laughs> and also <clears throat> to be sure that I cover all of the salient points in the short time I have, I've decided that I should write my speech. So I apologize, but I hope you'll indulge me that I will read it. <clears throat> the development of glasses and processes used to make optical, uh, low-loss optical fibers for communications has roots stretching back 30 years before the invention of the laser. In 1930, a young organic chemist by the name of Frank Hyde was hired by Corning Glassworks to explore ways to combine newly discovered organic materials called plastics with inorganic glasses to form glass-like materials. In the course of his investigations, <clears throat> he filed a US patent application in 1934 disclosing how vapors of silicon tetrachloride, when passed through a flame, would hydrolyze to form very fine glassy powders, which he called soot, of pure fused silica glass. Now, fused silica <clears throat> is the most refractory of all glasses, but had limited commercial use at the time because it could only be made by melting quartz crystals with oxyhydrogen torches or electric arcs at temperatures exceeding 2,000 degrees centigrade. And even at this temperature, it is an extremely viscous glass and very difficult to form into useful articles. The new method that Dr. Hyde discovered, called flame hydrolysis, showed promise to provide an easier way to make fused silica products, such as tubes, crucibles, and optical elements. A few years later, also in the Corning Laboratories in 1939, Dr. Martin Nordberg, shown here, discovered that the addition of about 8% titania to the fused silica would further reduce its already low thermal expansion to essentially zero. His patent application disclosed how this glass could be made by, flame, uh, by Hyde's flame hydrolysis process using mixtures of titanium and silicon tetrachloride vapors, but no commercial silica products were ever developed, and the further work on this process was stopped. In the 1950s, <clears throat> this flame hydrolysis process was resurrected at Corning to meet a growing demand for large, clear blanks of pure fused silica that could be formed into acoustic delay lines for radar and large mirror blanks for a new generation of high precision astronomical telescopes. In this new iteration of the process, shown here for an example in a patent by Nietzsche, multiple flame hydrolysis burners were arrayed on the top of a refractory brick furnace. The burners created the silica soot streams and heated the furnace to greater than 1700 degrees centigrade to simultaneously deposit and fuse the soot into a clear glass blank called a boule, layer by layer in a rotating refractory cup. Now the resultant pure fused silica boule was then shaped by grinding and polishing into delay lines, mirrors, and even windows for spacecraft. This method was also employed later to make Nordberg's ultra-low expansion titania doped silica glass, renamed ULE, that was also used for mirrors, including lightweight optics for spy satellites and even the Hubble spacecraft telescope, one segment of which is shown here. During the 1950s, a Dr. Robert Maurer, a physicist at Corning, carefully studied the relative light scattering in glass. His results, which he published in 1956 and 1960, indicated that these boules of fused silica had the lowest Rayleigh scattering relative to all of the different glasses that he measured, about 10 times lower than the best optical glasses. Corning scientists <clears throat> first became aware of the need for low loss optical fibers on June 17, 1966, when this gentleman, Dr. William Shaver, met at Electrosil, a subsidiary of Corning in Sunderland, with several representatives of the British government, including members of the ministries of aviation, 
radar, and signal research and development, who were looking for help to make fiber. Dr. Shaver was a sort of roving scientist for Corning, who visited laboratories and companies around the world in search of new opportunities for its materials and products. When Dr. Shaver returned to Corning, he told Dr. William Armistead, head of the Corning R&D facilities, about this developing need for pure glass fiber optics. Dr. Armistead was interested and decided to pursue the idea further, assigning the task to Bob Maurer, in part due to Bob's earlier work on light scattering in glass. Now, the initial design requirements given to Dr. Shaver in that meeting were for a single mode fiber, 100 micron diameter, <clears throat> one micron core, having a total attenuation of 20 decibels per kilometer, similar, by the way, to the attenuation of copper wire. To put this attenuation goal in perspective, keep in mind that the very best optical glasses of the day had attenuations of about 1,000 decibels per kilometer. And these were not in this special fiber form. This meant that an improvement in transparency of 10 to the 98th was needed to reach that 20 dB per kilometer goal. It is hardly obvious at that time that this goal could ever really be reached. Bob Maurer was familiar also with the work of Eli Snitzer, who we've heard about this morning on the laser, glass laser and fiber laser. <clears throat> Eli Snitzer at American Optical published in 1961 a paper in which short single mode glass fibers were first demonstrated. Bob began his work with a summer intern in 1967 drawing short lengths of single mode fibers from conventional glass fiber cores placed in capillary tubes, a sort of rod and tube approach. The losses were very high, but the results suggested better glasses and better processes might yield better results. Influenced by his earlier work on light scattering, he decided to look at fused silica. A furnace capable of drawing this high temperature glass was available in the Corning lab. And so again, using this rod and tube approach, he made fibers using Corning's commercial fused silica as the cladding and that ULE glass as the core since its refractive index was higher than that of the pure fused silica. Losses were still very high, 10 dBs per meter. But Bob was encouraged enough to continue. Bill Armistead agreed, and he approved the addition of two scientists to this low-key effort in 1967. One of those new additions was me. I had joined Corning as a scientist in the July of 1967, direct from Rutgers University with a PhD in glass science. My first assignment was to take a fresh look at, at Hyde's flame hydrolysis process, <clears throat> see what else we could, be, could be done with this technology. I built a small bull furnace in my laboratory, <clears throat> and I began making various dope-fused silicas and measuring their properties. In January of 1968, Don Keck, a PhD physicist, joined Corning and began working full-time on the fiber project, having been recruited from Michigan State by Bob. Based on Bob's early results, we focused our attentions entirely on the fused silica fibers made by flame hydrolysis. However, I must remind you, our approach was a bit counterintuitive in that we were essentially adding an impurity to the pure fused silica in order to raise its refractive index in the core. Again, it was not at all clear at that time that this so-called doping technique would work. Much later, we learned that we were, in fact, the only group pursuing this high silica approach at that time. Our initial results were no better than Bob's. We tried various methods of cleaning and polishing the rods of ULE and the tubes of fused silica. Still, the losses remained far too high. We tried depositing the fused silica cladding onto a core rod inside of that furnace. Didn't work. And then we realized <clears throat> one source of the high loss was the formation of reduced titanium color centers during the high temperature fiber drawing step. We learned to anneal these away by heat treating the fibers at 800 to 1,000 degrees centigrade. But this, in turn, drastically weakened the fibers due to surface crystallization. We experimented with lower levels of titania. Although we made some progress, losses remained very high, not much better than conventional glass. Then we hit on an idea, and it proved to be the key. 
Since the core of the single mode design was only one tenth of the diameter of the fiber, why not try depositing a thin layer of the core glass soot onto the inside surface of a flame polished tube? This might greatly reduce light scattering at the core clad interface, which by now we knew to be a major loss source. After a series of experiments to develop the process, we made our first fiber preform. The equipment we used, shown here, was crude but effective. A lathe headstock made from a large ball bearing held the rotating cladding tube in front of a flame hydrolysis burner. The burner produced a soot stream containing 1.5% titania doped silica glass. When at first our soot stream didn't go into the tube, as you can see in this photo, a home vacuum cleaner was attached to the tail end of the tube and very beautifully sucked the soot out of the flame into the tube and it deposited on the inside wall of the tube. This coated tube was then placed in the fiber draw furnace where the soot sintered into a clear glass layer. The hole collapsed to form a solid rod containing the doped core, which was then drawn down into fiber. After heat treatment, the fiber loss was measured. To our great surprise and delight, after several attempts, the attenuation would reduce, was reduced to 17 decibels per kilometer. We had done it. Don Keck wrote in his lab notebook after making this now famous measurement, whoopee. That first fiber was very short, it was very difficult to measure such low losses, so we went on to work making more fibers by this approach, destroying several vacuum cleaners in the process. <laughs> but we confirmed our results and in fact reached a low value of 16 decibels per kilometer on an almost one kilometer length of fiber. This time, Don wrote in his notebook the more reserved response, QED, Latin phrase, quad erat demonstrandum that which was to be demonstrated. In May of 1970, we filed patent applications disclosing the use of dope fused silicas for communication fibers and the method of making these fibers by depositing the core glass on the inside of a cladding glass tube. These would prove to be very valuable to Corning in future years. In September of 1970, 40 years ago, Bob attended the Institute of Electrical Engineering Conference right here in London and publicly announced that we had made a fiber with a total attenuation of only 16 dBs per kilometer. We then published an article in Applied Physics Letters shortly afterwards. Ironically, a review article published in the same month in the Proceedings of IEEE entitled Optical Communications, A Decade of Preparations stated, quote, at the present time, the glass used in fiber optics is indeed very lossy, amounting to a decibel per meter at the very best, which makes this material clearly unsuitable for long distance transmission. We were careful not to disclose or to discuss the details of our fiber compositions and our fabrication methods outside of our laboratory since we soon realized that we were far ahead of our competition, including the British Post Office, STL, and AT&T. At their request, Bob brought samples of our fragile fibers to these companies so they could verify our measurements. He carefully tried to gather up every scrap of fiber that broke off during these tests, but did not always succeed. Once the attenuation results were confirmed, efforts intensified in all of these laboratories to catch up to us, since their earlier work focused primarily on the millimeter waveguide technology and others, as we heard in the last talk. Despite the fact that this breakthrough fiber solution was not exactly robust, Corning management decided to move the project into the development stage in 1971. Engineers were assigned to look for ways to make enough fiber to supply samples to potential customers and joint development partners that the business team was trying to line up. I might mention this is a little bit like trying to build gas stations before the invention of the automobile. Meanwhile, I focused my own attention on evaluating other dopants to try to eliminate that troublesome heat treatment that uh, weakened the fibers so badly. We also learned that a preferred fiber design at the time was now the multi-mode fiber rather than the single-mode fiber, and to take advantage of commercially available LED light sources that could 
be more readily coupled into a large <coughs> core multimode fiber. To make such fibers, both graded and step index, we developed another flame hydrolysis approach <coughs> that we later dubbed the outside vapor deposition process, or OVD. In this method, first the core and then the cladding soot were deposited directly onto a rotating bait rod to build up a porous fiber soot preform. <coughs> this preform, containing both the graded index core and the cladding of the fiber, was then sintered into a bubble-free glass blank, and by keeping the core glass at low temperatures during this sintering step, we could now incorporate dopants that used to vaporize in that higher temperature Boole process. One of these dopants was germania, a glass former like silica. In June of 1972, we drew the first multimode fiber preform containing 9% germania in the core. We immediately knew that we were on the right track. We could see the radiant light of the draw furnace shining brightly through the end of over a kilometer of fiber already on that wind-up drum. Don measured the attenuation, only 4 dBs per kilometer without any need for any fiber heat treatment. Fiber strength was excellent. The first truly practical low-loss fiber was made. The OVD process and the germania dope fibers were quickly transferred to the development stage, scaled up to make larger and larger preforms of multimode graded index fiber. In early 1973, we published a paper based on the measurements we made on these multimode fibers predicting that fiber loss could reach as low as 2 dBs per kilometer beyond 800 nanometers and 0.2 dBs per kilometer at 1,550 nanometers. This is very close to the values routinely achieved today in production. In 1975, Corning began building a pilot plant that came online in 1976. The commercialization of these inventions was underway. Once the, our patent applications became public knowledge, other researchers in the USA and Japan developed variations on these concepts. One of these was called the Modified CVD Process, or MCVD, developed by McChesney and O'Connor at Bell Labs in late 1973. In this process, the core glass layers were deposited in a rotating fused silica cladding tube by, heat, by heating the tube from the outside with a torch. When the hydrolyzable core of glass vapors passed through the tube, they reacted in the heat of the traversing torch to create soot deposits on the inside wall. A variation of the OVD process was developed by Izawa, Miyashita, and Hanawa at NTT in 1977. OVD torches were positioned to deposit the core, cladding, all of that soot axially onto the end of a rotating and retracting bait rod. This process became known as vapor axial deposition, or VAD. Today, the OVD process, MCVD process, and VAD process together account for all fiber made for telecom applications. <coughs> Notice we had ties on. However, Bob, Don, and I had a new and maybe exciting, but certainly unexpected career awaiting us as our patents, as once our patents became widely used, we became witnesses in patent litigation. <laughs> to protect its position, Corning aggressively defended its fiber patents. We three spent countless hours in depositions and trials, but in all cases, the patents were held valid, enforceable, and infringed. These actions, in fact, helped shape the industry for many years to come. Today, 40 years and 1.3 billion kilometers of fiber later, virtually every communication fiber is still made by the soot deposition processes and using the glass compositions that can be based, traced back to these original inventions. Thank you very much.